The next subtopic under finance and fiscal policy is informal finance and the rise of microfinance. Let's start with traditional informal finance. In the world, 1.4 billion adults have no access to banking. This means it's harder for them to save, borrow, send money, or even to start a business. Much economic activity in developing nations comes from small-scale producers and enterprises. Most are non-corporate, unlicensed, unregistered enterprises including small farmers, producers, artisans, tradespeople, and independent traders operating in the informal urban and rural sectors of the economy. Their demands for financial services are unique and outside the purview of traditional commercial bank lending. For example, street vendors need short-term finance to buy inventories. Small farmers require buffer loans to tie them over uncertain seasonal income fluctuations, and small-scale manufacturers need minor loans to purchase simple equipment or hire non-family workers. In such situations, traditional commercial banks are both ill-equipped and reluctant to meet the needs of these small borrowers because the sums involved are usually less than $1,000, but the administration and carrying costs are high and also few informal borrowers have the necessary collateral to secure formal sector loans. Commercial banks are simply not interested. Thus, most non-corporate borrowers have traditionally had to turn to family or friends as a first line of finance and then warily to, to local professional money lenders, phone brokers, and tradespeople. As a backup, these latter sources of finance are extremely costly. Money lenders, for example, can charge up to 20% a day in interest for short-term loans to traders and vendors include local rotating savings and credit associations and group lending schemes. In the case of rotating savings and credit associations or ROSCAS, which can be found in such diverse countries as Mexico, Bolivia, Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, and the Philippines, even Sri Lanka, India, China, and South Korea, a group of up to 50 individuals selects leaders who collect a fixed amount of savings from each member. This fund is then allocated on a rotating basis to each member as an interest-free loan. Now let's proceed to microfinance institutions. Microfinance is a supply of credit, saving vehicles, and other basic financial services made available to poor and vulnerable people who might otherwise have no access to them or could borrow only on a high favorable terms. Microfinance institutions specialize in delivering these services in various ways and according to their own institutional rules. And in the case of village banking or group lending schemes, a group of potential borrowers forms a association to borrow funds from a commercial bank, a government development bank, a NGO, and a private institution. The group then allocate the funds to individual members whose responsibility is to pay the group. the group itself guarantees the loan to the outside lender. It is the responsible for repayment. The idea is simple. By joining together, a group of small borrowers can reduce the cost of borrowing and because the loan is large, can gain access to formal commercial credit. In place of joint liability, group members have a vested interest in the success of the enterprise and therefore exert strong pressure on borrowing members to repay on time. The evidence shows that repayment rates compare favorably, favorably with commercial sector borrowers. Economic research has consistently found that availability of credit is a binding constraint for microenterprise development, and a majority of microenterprises are operated by women, but lack of credit particularly, though certainly not exclusively affects women borrowers. For reasons ranging from lack of property rights to local cultural practices, but lack of collateral is arguably the most important. Let's look a little more closely at how this works. There are three related factors that make it difficult to relax credit constraints to low-income female banker entrepreneurs. First, poor banker entrepreneurs often have little or no collateral. Second, it is difficult for conventional lenders to determine borrower's quality. And third, small loans are more costly to process per dollar lend. Now let's discuss three current policy debates under microfinance institutions. One debate under rail in the microenterprise credit community is whether subsidies are appropriate, known as the microfinance system. 
the debate pits the consultative group to assist the poor or the CGAP. A donor consortium had partnered with Indian World Bank and other mainstream donors against other NGO and academic economists. Confronting the schism between rhetoric and action and between financially minded donors and socially minded programs will first require both donors and practitioners to pay greater attention to who is being served. Proponents argue that it may be useful to tie credit to social services that are demanded only by the poor and inherently require time for participation for at least three reasons. First, such required participation can act as a kind of spin mechanism to ensure that non poor borrowers and are not taking advantage of the subsidy not intended for them. Second is that the poor generally cannot make adequate use of credit without better health and education. There is usually at least some subsidy in programs that offer health and educational services along with credit. And the third one, many of the poor appear not to be really recognized the importance of human capital and the availability of credit may act as a clue to get them involved in health and education programs, but it may be less costly to keep this program separate in accordance with the varying comparative advantage of different NGOs and some low-income borrowers do not need these services. Accordingly, there is growing debate in the microfinance community over whether to integrate credit with education and health and other programs and there is a study of a program combining microfinance with basic business training which shows that it may be cost effective. The third ongoing debate related to the first two debates is whether microfinance institutions should undergo commercialization whereby a non-profit organization providing microfinance is converted into a for-profit bank. Advantages include the fact that the microfinance institution became or becomes regulated as a bank and so can leg legally accept savings deposits as well as its loans that the microfinance institution acquires the discipline of the market and an added incentive to cut costs and expand its scale. Commercialization also follows the key objective in some of the microfinance sector to make use of the microfinance as a vehicle to develop the overall financial system. However, this advantage includes the problem that people living in poverty become considered in some cases too expensive to serve and if they are served, the high interest rates will be charged and exclusively tactics may be used to collect funds. Potential limitations of microfinance as a development strategy. Microfinance has some potentially important limitations. Microcredit was first conceived and is still largely marketed as financing for microenterprises. But most people probably prefer irregular wage and salary to running a whiskey microenterprise. Although systematic evidence is lacking, interviews with factory workers in developing countries such as Peru and Bangladesh suggest that many are former microentrepreneurs who gave up their enterprise in favor of a regular job. Most people are willing to pay for insurance and predictable wage offers insurance against vagueness of enterprise proceeds. Our next subtopic is reforming financial systems, financial liberalization, real interest rates, savings, and investments. The restriction of loans to a few large borrowers together with the widespread existence of high inflation Growing budget deficits and negative real interest rates lead to serious credit crunch among developing countries during the 1980s. The global recessions of 1981 to 1982 and the 1987 exposed the fertility of many development bank loans so that by the end of the decade, almost half of these banks were reporting 50% or more of their loans in arrears and other quarter had delinquency rate in excess of 25% with real interest rates on savings deposits in the negative and expectations of continued inflation and exchange rate devaluation contributing to substantial capital flight, it is not surprising that few individuals were willing to save. In addition, commercial banks and other commercial intermediaries were subject to numerous lending restrictions and faced mandatory interest rate ceilings on loanable funds at levels well below market clearing rates. These artificial interest rate ceilings were often set by governments seeking to finance their budget deficits through the sale of low-interest bonds to private commercial banks. These banks in turn had to resort to rationing the available credit beyond the normal credit rationing observed in developed economies. 
To help us better understand, figure here shows that an impact of binding normal interest rate ceilings at below market clearing levels with the interest rate ceiling at which is below the market clearing equilibrium rate tag as RE, the demand for loanable funds L2 greatly exceeds the available supply L1. The excess demand leads to a need to ration the limited supply. It is a phenomenon known as financial repression because investments is limited or repressed by a shortage of savings, which in turn results from administered real interest rates below what would occur in a market setting. In the absence of the outright corruption in the allocation of L1, loanable funds most commercial banks choose to allocate the available credit to few large borrowers so as to minimize the administrative overhead costs as a proportion to the total cost of lending. Thus, the net effect of government controls over lending rates is that even fewer loans to be allocated to small investors. Banks can cover the additional administrative costs and the added risk of slower loans only by charging higher interest rates. Hence, small farmers and urban entrepreneurs have no recourse to, to seek finance from the unorganized money market where, as we see in the figure, they are willing to pay the above market clearing rates, known as RE. One suggested solution to the problem is to liberalize the financial sector by allowing nominal interest rates to rise the market clearing levels. This would cause real interest rates to rise to positive levels and thus remove explicit interest rate subsidy accorded to preferred borrowers, who are powerful enough to gain access to the Russian credit. Higher real in rates would Higher real gates should also generate more domestic saving and investment to permit some borrowers to shift from the unorganized to the organized credit market. In an effort to identify how governments can work effectively within the context of liberalized financial markets, the 2001 novel Lord Joseph Stiglitz and his co-authors isolated seven major market failures that imply the potential goal for state intervention. Its basic argument is that financial markets are markedly different from other markets. The market failures are likely to be more pervasive in these markets and that much of the rational aid for liberalizing financial markets is based neither on a sound economic understanding of how these markets work nor on the potential scope for government intervention. The seven market failures that he and his colleague identified are the following. Public good nature of monitoring financial institutions, externalities and monitoring selection and lending, externalities of financial disruption, missing and incomplete markets, imperfect competition, inefficiency of competitive markets in the financial sector, and lastly, uninformed investors. The last topic in my report is debate on the role of stock markets. In this section, we take a look at stock markets in developing countries and consider some proposed policies to get most benefit from these markets. We also consider some of the limitations of depending too heavily on stock markets as an engine of growth. Some studies have suggested that stock market development can play a highly constructive role in encouraging growth. This study showed that greater past stock market development predicts faster subsequent economic growth. Even after other variables known to influence growth, such as the rate of investment in education are accounted for. Even more striking, both banking and stock market development were found to have independent positive effects on growth, suggesting that each plays a somewhat different role in the economy. A correlation between the stock market development and the growth would be expected by many theories, including the view of the finance follows industry. Therefore, the industrial growth and stock market growth could occur together. But in this case, stock market growth would merely reflect on the growth of the real sector. The fact that there is faster growth after greater stock market development has already been realized and suggested of casualty but is not conclusive. This is because financial debt is correlated with future debt. Countries that had well-developed stock markets in the past usually do in the future as well. So, so the correlation between growth and the past debt could really be driven by the third factor, such as the protection of third property or the rule of law. However, the result suggests that stock markets have two role to play. Moreover, we can expect that stock markets promote the more general availability of liquidity and risk diversification services. May serve to motivate and entrepreneurs who may later go public and provide incentives for managerial performance that make it easier for firms to raise capital in any form. 
The question then is, should the government do anything to develop and promote the markets given the remaining uncertainty about the importance of the role? It makes no sense to actively develop stock markets unless certain prerequisites are met. First, one needs macro stability. Investors will not invest in equity without it. Second, policy credibility is needed. How will policymakers make economies stabilize? And how they will react in a financial crisis to prevent a meltdown? And third, one needs a solid domestic firm base. There's no point to opening a stock market if there are free firms and the outside investors would wish to take an equity stake.